So I'm Shelly DiCecco. Uh, compression is something I love and also hate. That I love it when my patients are ready for it, but I hate the stress that it brings upon us as clinicians. That am I going to make the right choice for that patient? Is it going to fit right? Is it going to not cause harm? And is it going to do what I want? So I love all the science and stuff behind it, but as aggravated as you as patients get with it, we as therapists and clinicians do too, because even though I know everything behind them and I look at you and I see what I see, everyone's different. Are you going to like it? Are you going to hate it? We won't know until it comes in sometimes. So I don't have an easy fix for you, unfortunately. I saw a lot of the questions for my uh, presentation was on what will work for this or that. There's no perfect garment for one perfect type of thing. That whatever works for my nine o'clock patient is not gonna work for my 10 o'clock patient. So it is a game that we tr have to try to see what will work with you. Um, so it's not an, as easy as that. So what I wanna do is kind of go over really the science behind what garments are meant to do and how we select it as therapists to help you as our patients and also clinicians to select the best possible garment the first time out and hope that it works. And if not, where are some problems and what might we need to do to pick a better garment the next time? I am a cat person and you will see lots of cat cartoons in my stuff, I'm sorry. <laughs> So you have to understand how garments are made. So it was kind of alluded to in the last talk. When you read about the different garments when you're trying to compare them, a lot of these words start to sound confusing and it doesn't always relate to what we think it might be. So understanding that your yarn is wrapped. This is why your garments do better the more you wash them. My blue jeans do better the less I wash them. If you don't wash your garments, then the oils and dirts get in between these coils and actually cause your garment to break down. So if you want it to last the full six months that your hopefully insurance is gonna cover next year, wash your garment after every use. The power is how easy we can stretch it. That how are we able to actually move the garment so that you can one, put it on, but also so that it allows you to have a muscle contraction while you were wearing it. Extensibility is how much it's going to extend. Your circular knits have a higher extensibility than your flat knit garments. Stiffness is really related kind of to the thickness, but it's how stiff is the garment. Especially with lip edema, often the more stiff the garment is, the less it's going to cut into lobules or dig into your thighs. So having a stiffer garment is often much more comfortable than having one with less stiffness. And then thickness is thickness. So there are a few principles behind why garments work. This is going to be the cliff version of science. I'm not gonna to try to go into completely explaining the different things, but one of them is Starling's hypothesis. What we're trying to do when we're talking about fluid is we're trying to reduce the amount of fluid that is coming out into the tissues that could be extra fluid. So we're trying to put pressure back against your capillary bed to slow down what your arteries and capillaries are throwing out as they pass through the tissue. So it's to counteract that force. The law of Laplace, what it's stating, the two components that really relate to garments, is the smaller the radius, the greater the pressure. So even if your garment is not gradiated, or gra excuse me, can't talk today, it does not have a gradient to it, if it's the same compression the whole length, as long as your leg or arm is in a nice cone shape, then you've created your own gradient. It's when we have the curves where our knee is smaller or this area is smaller, that if it's not got a gradient to it, you could cause some problems in those areas. The other is the tension. So the higher the compression level, obviously the higher pressure you're going to get. So this image is just kind of showing if our legs were perfect cones that you would have higher uh, compression down here because the lower radius gives you greater tension and then the higher up on the leg would be less tension. The other one is the part of the gradients. What we're trying to do, the reason why you want gradients is because you're trying to help gravity or fight gravity to help move stuff back out of the tissues. So if I just have 20 degrees of mercury pressure the whole length of the leg, 
when I go to walk and the muscles start to contract against that garment, by not having a variance in the pressure levels, the fluid can also go south. There's nothing forcing it up, and in fact, gravity saying, come play with me, come on down here, fluid, I really love you. So you need two different pressures so that as you're walking or moving your arm with those garments on, you're encouraging that fluid to go up the calf pump or up your arm to go back into the central system to be absorbed. So it shows here what would happen if you exercise without garments on as your muscle expands versus if you have garments on, it puts more pressure on that muscle so it can't expand as much. Garments are put in classes. Of course, we can't decide on one class for the entire world. Each country has to have their own classes, which also adds confusion to it. So this gives you the different ones. The main thing to kind of keep in mind is typically when you're talking about Durkin's, Madeleine's, or lipedema, you're usually going to be, I want to point at this one, which none of y'all can see, you're going to be usually in the class two or less, unless you have severe lymphedema or swelling issues on top of your lymphedema, you are usually not going to be in class three or four. But sometimes when people see the size of the limb, they're all like, oh my gosh, you've got to be in a or class three, which is not the case because the size difference is not due to edema, it's due to adipose tissue. And so there is a difference that if you get in too high of compression classes, it's gonna bruise you more, it's gonna be more painful, and it's actually not gonna be any more effective. So the best compression class for you to wear is the one that you can get on and that you will wear. You may need a class two, but if you can't get a class two on and you're not gonna wear it, a class one is better than a class zero. So what are some differences from the different garments you'll see? Well, one, we want you to have success. But I don't know how many times I've had patients come in that have had either mild wounds or significant wounds and they've been put into a garment. It's not very easy to the skin if you were sliding a garment over that wound, you're constantly causing damage to it. So you've got to have actual healthy skin. If you are not healthy skin, you need more of the Velcro garments or bandaging, not a garment you're sliding over it. You want to try to minimize the, the distortion, especially for the higher levels, because again, as you're trying to pull it up, it's going to get caught in the different folds or the components. Garments, unless they're elastic, are meant to maintain. So a garment is not going to reduce your swelling because tomorrow when I go to put the garment back on, I can stretch it right back out to its full length. So sometimes we'll see where patients are put in garments when they still have pitting or that ability for us to leave marks on you, that's not going away because you put a garment on. You need to do other stuff to get rid of that overlying swelling and then you get the garment to maintain it. You gotta be willing to wear it. If you're not gonna wear it, there's no use getting the garment which also comes back to us, it's gotta be something that you will wear when we pick it for you. You've gotta be able to get it on and off. That I know I had a little lady that she liked to do aquatics therapy, but if she did aquatics, her daughter couldn't put her garment on. So we had a deal as long as you quietly sit in the front office, as soon as someone gets a second, they will put your garments on for you so that she could keep wearing them. So you have to have a way to get it on. You may not all come to my clinic, I am sorry. I am not gonna put all of your garments on. You have to clean them, kind of like what we just went over. They lose their elasticity and break down if you don't clean them. You have to be able to see and monitor yourself. You need to know if you're getting a sore either from the garment itself or just from something else. And you've got to know, are we doing it to manage something else to get you to a hurdle? Or are we looking at palliative needs for certain patients? There are some contraindications. If you don't have good arterial supply and you're below a 0.5 on your ABI, we're not supposed to be compressing that because what it's saying is you don't have the ability to get the artery supply to that part of the limb barely as it is, and especially if you put compression onto it. If you are in congestive heart failure, we're not supposed to put compression on you unless we have approval by the cardiologist. Um, again, deep skin folds for some patients. Garments are never really going to be that 
um, successful because of the size of the folds they have. It's going to cut in, it's gonna cause sores, it's going to be painful. The Velcro garments have been a blessing since they came onto the market, but that can help with some of those patients. If you have a lot of weeping or ulcerations, again, you're not supposed to be putting on the circular knit or the flat knit garments with wounds and a lot of weeping. You should be putting on, again, more Velcro. And if you can't feel, I had a patient, I could smell her coming down the hall because her caregiver had not taken her garment off of her for 10 days. She had no sensation in her leg and nearly lost a couple toes. So if you can't feel what the garment's doing to you, you don't need a garment like that on. So I put these pictures up here because this is actually a child's leg, has no adipose on the leg whatsoever, but you can see that the garment already caused a sore, probably because the kid was running around so much, sweaty, pulling on the garment, it caused a kind of a heat irritation. And then obviously you can see the one below, this patient does not need to be going back into a garment anytime soon. For daytime, I remember when I came out, I've been doing lymphedema treatment for 21, almost 22 years. They were not cute that long ago. <laughs> so we have come a long way in garments of what's available, that, and especially now since COVID, where everyone wants to wear leggings wherever they go, that you can blend in a little bit better with some of the choices that are out there. So there is no perfect day garment. It's what you're going to wear that helps you with your condition and doesn't cause harm. So you have, this is what we talk about with the Velcro garments, are these. They can also be reductive. Because you can change them with the Velcro, you can lose fluid with the Velcro garments. So sometimes I will use those to reduce the patient during treatment because they don't want to be bandaged, and then they have a garment to wear when we are done. Your circular knit are usually your thinner materials, but now a lot of the companies have kind of a crossover where it's a little bit thicker than your standard circular knit, and so it's able to kind of bridge the gap. Because the problem with circular knit is it's very thin and is going to dig into those lobules. The reason they get their names is how they're made. If you can ever go to a factory, like we have one in South Georgia, uh, Sigveris has a plant down there that they let you do tours. It's like Willy Wonka in the chocolate factory, other than they don't give you chocolate that it sews it in a circle and then you hear all the noises going and then it just spits it out at you. And they all come out white and then they put them on a thing and dip these legs or arms down into the vats to dye them for you. So flat knit is literally sewn flat is how it is made and then it is brought together and that is why they have the seam in it because that's how it makes your shape. But it is actually a flat garment when it is made. Your inelastic is the Velcro, and then you have all of the different spandex or the Bioflex, Salida, and all of those, which again, don't necessarily have the gradient to them, and there's no research behind why it does work. We just know for some patients it does. Your nighttime garments, I call these your get out of jail free garments. This keeps you from coming back to see me as much because it undoes what you did during the day so that if you need to wear a lesser compression during the day because you can't put on a tighter garment or it cuts in too much, your nighttime garment helps you reduce everything done back while you're sleeping so when you wake up in the morning, it's back down to a smaller size or healthier tissues. Usually your nighttime are gonna be again the inelastic or they're gonna look more like oven mitts. They've again come a long way with that. They used to be very thick oven mitts. Now you can sleep in much thinner oven mitts. But it allows the skin uh, to get oxygen at night while you're sleeping, which is why you don't want to sleep in a daytime garment. It's kind of like if you ever wore a cast and you take the cast off and all that skin just keeps sloughing with it. That's what's happening when you sleep in a night or a day garment at night continuously is your skin's getting that unhealthy component to it. So you do need to typically either be in a nighttime bandaging or nothing, depending on your case. So how do you select the correct garment? Again, it depends on what are your needs? How severe is your condition? What are we trying to address? Where is it located? You typically need to go two inches above where the swelling stops. I've seen so many times patients come in, the swelling's all the way up the thigh and into the trunk, but they got knee highs on. So all you're doing is moving it from the calf to the thigh, but you're not moving it from the thigh out of the leg. 
So you're supposed to go at least two inches above. How much pressure do you need? Do you need a class one? Do you need a therapeutic? What is the size and the function of the limb? Am I going to be standing a lot for my job? Am I going to be moving a lot for my job where I'm constantly bending that joint and I may need something different because of that motion? Um, how, what, is this, what does my leg feel like or my arm? Is it soft and squishy or is it more hard and fibrotic because that's gonna determine what type of garment I can wear. That I don't want something cutting into my uh, limb. How sensitive you can get them, if you're gonna have to get custom, you can get silk lined at the joints so that it doesn't rub into that soft spot in front of your elbow or behind your knee. What are my other issues? Do I have rheumatoid arthritis where I can't pull up a garment? Do I have other conditions? Can I reach my feet? If you can't reach your feet, it's very hard to get a non-zippered garment lassoed around your leg and pulled back up. Comfort cosmetics. I had a patient, I could not figure out why she could not get better. She had a very mild case of lymphedema, not even lipedema. She was taking her stuff off as soon as she left the clinic because she was single and she was hoping she'd meet a cute guy at the pharmacy where she worked. So, I don't know if she ever did. Uh, <laughs> can you tolerate it? That if, again, if you have rheumatoid, can you tolerate that level of compression? Or with the lipedema or Gherkins, if you have a lot of pain, can you tolerate it? When do you need the garment by? Do you need it because you're going out of the country or something and you need it sooner, or can you wait for the length of time it takes to be uh, shipped in? Another one is you want to be the smallest you can when you get measured. And you also, I wouldn't thought I'd have to tell people this, you want them to actually measure you, the limb that's involved, on the actual skin. These are things I keep hearing from my patients when they come back from fitters. So it needs to be on the skin, the involved areas, and when you're at your smallest point. The ILF, which is the International Lymphedema Framework, they put out a nice grid. I made it bigger for you. But it kind of goes through for either as a patient or a clinician, because none of you are going to be sent for ABIs right now on this picture. But that's what this did, is it took you out because you can't tolerate compression. But it goes through kind of who's supposed to be in class one, who's in class two, to help you kind of see what garments do I really need for what's involved. And this is a nice free document that you can get from the International Epidemia Frameworks website. I put this in here too so you kind of know where they're measuring. So if you're gonna get something that's off the shelf, meaning it's pre-made and it has ranges, this is the areas that should be measured typically for arms and legs. As you can see, the problem sometimes with these off the shelf, why it may not fit you, look how much real estate's not getting measured. So what if you have a large lobule at the knee, or you had a surgery where they took out a lot of tissue and your fibros down and have a concavity kind of aspect there? So this is why sometimes off-the-shelf garments, even though you fit perfectly in those ranges, doesn't perfectly fit you because you're more than just five or six measurements. This is what a custom, this is what your, if you didn't ever look at the form, this is what your fitter is measuring you. This is why when you get fidgety on the table, we get irritated because of trying to find the marks again. So this is what we have to go through to make sure we have a garment. You can see how it really kind of cuts you out more and fits in all the different aspects. So how do you problem solve? So if the garment is too tight, there's a couple reasons what could have occurred. Is it truly the correct size? Um, did you change in size? I had a patient that she was extremely depressed from cancer and she had actually gained weight so much in the uh, seven day period that she could no longer wear the garment. So have you actually changed weight that could be why the garment's not fitting? It's not to be accusatory or anything, but it's just that that's a possibility, and so maybe we need to look at different garment options. Maybe you have some underlying comorbidity that we didn't know about, like rheumatoid or arterial disease, that it's causing the garment to feel extra tight or painful that we need to look into. Did you put it on correctly? When you look at a garment, it should look the same transparency the whole length. But what I'll see sometimes is it's, you know, you can barely see through the calf part, but we pulled so much on the thigh part, it's completely transparent. 
it's supposed to be uh, across the whole aspect looking the same because it should be evened out. Is it sliding down that it's maybe too short for you, not the correct size, and so it's actually sliding down and so it's making it kind of more compressive in certain areas? Is it the correct fabric for you? Again, the round knit's going to bite in more than the flat knit, so maybe you need a flat knit garment and not a round garment. If it's too loose, are you washing it? Because again, if those fibers get dirt, hair, grease in them, they can't shrink back so the garment or bandages are bigger than they should be. Is it old? In the US, we say every six months. If you go to Sweden, Germany, and some of the other countries, they'll tell you every four months for garments. Are you pulling it so much that it's kind of loosened out? I laughed at one of the new garments, I will not name names, on the market that when the rep, and I was like his fourth stop, got to me, the thing was so loose on him because he kept putting it on wrong. And I'm like, you're not really selling me on the garment because it's either the garment or you, but for some reason this is not working out. Um, is it sliding down? You can get stuff to kind of help hold it up. Um, it stays to pay glue. Things like that will help hold it up. Is it not maybe containing your shape? So instead what it's doing is it's kind of squishing out the top so then the garment's sliding down below it. So it's not actually capturing you correctly or containing you. And did you lose weight? Have you fluctuated some in other ways that the garment now is loose? Too long or too short? That are you distributing it equally? Or again, are you pulling it all the way up so now you have an extra two inches up at the top? Do you need a silicone band to kind of help you keep it up where it's supposed to be? The silicone bands also don't always clean well when you wash them, so sometimes you actually have to take alcohol on a cotton swab and rub each of those little balls that it doesn't get the stuff off of it so it won't stick. Sometimes with especially custom garments, we can put stuff in them to kind of fortify, especially the inner thigh is often one of the harder spots to deal with. They can fortify it with different materials or even more silicone bands that are going horizontal to help fortify that thigh or wherever you may have a lobule to help keep it up. One thing I always try to do for most of my custom patients is I take pictures, and I take pictures with sticky notes stuck to the patients so it shows where I measured everything because I'm not, an, I'm not an engineer. I am a therapist. I don't have, I can't even do Ikea stuff sometimes because there's just pictures. So I send it to the experts and they actually like it because then they can see exactly what I'm talking about if I can't figure this out or that out and they can build a better garment by sending images in sometimes. So encourage your fitters, hey, you wanna take shots of this? You can put sticky notes on me, Shelly says it works. But it'll say like A is here, should A be there or should B be there? So you can get their opinions. Don't just assume that things are done correctly. Uh, and don't look in these bright lights because now I'm blind. <laughs> I went to the International Lymphedema Framework when I was in Chicago and one of the presenters um, in other countries where you have the national health system what they require the garment companies to do is give them so many of the garments every time their contract's up for their engineers to test. And that's how they come back going, you didn't do so well on your test, so we're gonna give you this much money this year for each garment. And the number of times the garments did not match. So they would send five of garment A, and they would measure, do all of them, are they the same length if we hold them up? Do they have the same compression spread out? Are they the same color? Like they would do all the different tests on it and the number of times they don't come out the same. So if you're always getting this one garment, it always fits you right and this time it doesn't or just it's your first time wearing it and it doesn't fit right, it could be the garment. You could be correct and your fitter or therapist could be correct and the garment is wrong. The manufacturers, I've gotten three custom garments this year that for some reason have built-in fanny packs that I don't know what's going on with that particular company, but it's got like a little lobules back here where nothing's in them. So I don't know if they're trying to find ways for us to put our cell phone or what's happening, but there's one company that three different patients have messed that up. And then quality. 
I've called manufacturers of like, mm, I know how to put garments on, and this garment, I got three from the same batch, and they've all torn with me putting them on the first time. I don't have fingernails, we're not allowed to as therapists, I know I did not poke through them. I think you have an issue with this run. So don't think it's you that I can just never wear garments, nothing's gonna work, keep trying. I don't think the first tennis shoe you got fit you perfectly either. All right, I finished early. <laughs> well, we're in luck then, because we've got tons of questions. Woohoo! <laughs> what we got? All right. Are there disadvantages to long term wearing of compression, such as the body adapting and losing its ability to move length? at all on its own in compressed areas because it's become dependent on compression being present? It's a good question because there is a lot of things like some of the supplements we take that our bodies do get accustomed to and stop producing, but I haven't seen any studies or none of my patients where that has been an issue, that um, if they stop wearing them, they still have issues with it, and as long as they're complying, it's still working. So I don't think so because we're not necessarily adapting things on the inside to that degree that would change it. What is the best way to wash compression garments? How often should we use it? And how does the compression affect our lungs and breathing as well as our gut? Because it's tight. So that's a three-part question. So with, with washing it, you do want to look at, each company has their own recommended uh, care for it, so do look at that because it can affect your warranty. It's like anything else. If you get a stain on your couch and don't clean it correctly, there went your five-year warranty you paid for. Not that you get five years for garments. Please do not hear that I said that. <laughs> so you do need to look to see what the manufacturer suggests, but you do want to obviously wash it delicate. You can use even hand washing to do it that way, that you do want to take care of it, that you can't just throw this in with the towels at normal... Uh, I don't know the correct washing machine terms, the correct full cycle that's <laughs> meant for your jeans and everything else. And what was the... How often should we wash them? You should wash them after every wear. So at the end, you should... That's one reason I know we talked about do you need just two, but you need at least where one's washing, the other's ready to go the next day. So you do need to wash them after every time you wear them. It's... I, I say this, but sometimes you have to clarify, it's kind of like underwear. Not everyone washes underwear every day, you should too. So they both should be taken <laughs> off and washed at the end of each day. No. And what kind of soap should we be using to wash our garments? Again, that's gonna kind of look at the manufacturers. Um, I did, like, I laugh like Victoria's Secret would tell you to wash things in wool light, but a lot of the manufacturers tell you not to use mm -hmm. wool light because it actually destroys the elasticity. So there was a conspiracy with Victoria's Secret and wool light to make you buy more underwear. <laughs> that you do need to check on that. And some of us, because if you're, it's, it's up against your skin. So a lot of times the more hypoallergenic uh, laundry detergents are a little bit better because it's going to be so close to you that some of the other chemicals that are in some of the detergents can actually be an irritant and cause rashes or discomfort. And the last part of that question was, how does compression affect our lungs and breathing as well as our gut because it's tight? So typically on the trunk, because your trunk does have muscles, but it's not moving as much as your arm or leg would with the muscles doing such an expanse between relax to contract. So your trunk doesn't need quite as much compression typically, so that's another reason to get the gradients in your compression so that it's less on the trunk. So you need to make sure when you are getting that compression that you can do a full inhale and exhale and that you can bend and do stuff without it actually causing pain or discomfort. Thank you so much. Thank Shelley. you.